two trends we see now is, you know, how do we, you know, coordinate large amounts of computation and also, you know, the fundamentals of computing have always been computation, memory, and I.O. You know, so you do, you do operations, you store the results, and you move data around. Those are the three fundamentals. You know, the, the fundamental rules of computation were figured out in the 30s and 40s. Um, before they had computers, and that hasn't changed at all. The quantity is, you know, gone from one operation a second to, you know, trillions of trillions of operations a second. So building the computers at reasonable power and then coordinating the operations is, is there's a lot of work to do. And then expressing the software computation has, has been really interesting. And there's a, quite a large number of people working on that. Our guest today is Jim Keller, CEO of Henstorrent, which is an AI processor startup company. Jim is a legendary CPU designer who worked at Digital Equipment, AMD, Apple, Intel, Tesla, and others. Jim is the engineer of the engineer revered throughout the tech community. In this episode, we pick up where we left off and discuss Jim's view on the next generation computers. So here's Jim talking about his role as being the CEO of Testort. I'm CEO of a company that's building AI devices and we are building technology because, you know, some of our technical decisions are because I believe with the next couple of generations of chip, I will get, you know, a certain number of transistors on chips. The speed of the memory will change in certain ways. I need to this. A friend of mine told me the, the computer design is all about calling the ball five years in advance. So. Like when you do a computer design, it takes you a year to figure it out. That's one. A year to design it. A year to produce it. A year to validate it. A year to ship it. That's five years. <laughs> right? And then yep. there's a new one every year. So like there's a new iPhone chip every year. Right. And some of the ideas that people are working on, you know, like the most future, you know, the most open ideas will be in a product four or five years from now, right? And so then you have to guess what's going to happen, right? And then, and some things don't change very fast, like, like the server trends have been pretty stable for the last 15 years or so, right? But we're also going through a big inflection on how servers are built right now. Right. And, and then, you know, we chose to use RISC-V as a CPU architecture. You know, partly there's a reason for money and ownership, but there's also a reason of, you know, I believe there'll be more computer innovation in the next 10 years than the last 20, right? And I, you know, if I believe in innovation, mm -hmm. I can't be dependent on Intel or ARM or somebody else to do it for me. Or specifically, if you get a license for an ARM processor, you're not allowed to change it, right? And I believe we are at a point where things have to change very fast. Interesting. So, so if you believe in innovation, you want to be able to change it as fast as you can. If you believe in Moore's law and Bell's law, you know that we'll we are going to get more transistors. Um, more transistors enable new applications, new applications. It's a feedback loop. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I use a lot of the, yeah, you know, the big, the big ideas to kind of inform me, you know, I've been doing this for a while. So, um, and, you know, one, one thing people, you know, I've seen this a lot. You get a good design, you start refining it, and then people will tend to think the best thing to do next is refine some more. And occasionally you have to really do a clean sheet of paper. You have to take a new, you know, start from scratch every five years and really 
because otherwise you get stuck on your local optimizations. I see. So yeah, so, so something like, you know, Moore's law is really important. Bell's law is really important. Innovation is really important. And doing something very new from scratch almost just for the sake of doing it from scratch to get you out of local local optimizations is important. And so you think that what you're doing it with Tenstorrent is actually scratching I mean you 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 actually starting the new thing from scratch. Yeah, yeah, we have several very new things. And and you know that also that there's a risk to that because the new thing may not be as good as the refinement of the old thing. Um, yeah, there's a very fun book about science. Are you, are you into the philosophy of science? So, so here's two really good books. One is okay. uh, Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolution. Right? And he, he describes how science changes. So when when science comes up with a new paradigm like Moore's law, right? Uh -huh. It's a paradigm. It predicts a lot of things, but also doesn't predict everything. And ah. scientific paradigms tend to ignore information and phenomena outside their paradigm. Like the most famous one is for 2000 years, the world's smartest scientists and physicists all believed the earth was the center of the universe in Western culture. Right. And when they had many, many observations that were counter to that, they just tweaked their theories. Right. So they had something called epicycles, which explained why the planet sometimes went forward and sometimes went backwards. Right. Yeah. Now, if you put the sun in the middle of the solar system and the earth around it, you don't need epicycles. Right. But because they had a paradigm that would work really well, like like somebody said, you know, it didn't change because it didn't work. It changed at some point because it got too complicated. But they they figured it out, right? So, you know, mini computers, the people who are building those, they thought many, you know, workstations were too small, too slow, didn't have enough capacity. They weren't worried about workstations, but workstations were all the innovation happened. Right. And there's another book called Against Method. So people who want to go in the next step. So Paul Feyerabend wrote a book that said it's not just that paradigms ignore outside information. They they can't even see it. Like the paradigm becomes so good. You be you know, everything humans do becomes a little world in and of itself and actively rejects, you know, change. Ah. And if you want to do, be, you know, work on innovative new products, you have to actively embrace it and you have to work hard to make sure you, you're not trapped by your own thinking and ideas, which is, which is really interesting. Right. And sometimes starting over with a new, like the reason startups often go very fast is you start over with a new team you know, some people in the team try to replicate what they used to do, but if the team has a couple different people from different, you know, companies, different universities, they can't agree on what the old thing was, so they end up making something new, and then, then you can do something really new, which is really interesting. And yeah, yeah. and then I, I like to use Elon Musk as an example. Like everybody obviously knew that rockets were impossible to build from scratch and, you know, car companies had already figured everything out. And it turns out that wasn't true. You sure. know, you know, he built rockets that are somewhere between 10 and a hundred times cheaper than existing rocket infrastructure. And they, they land themselves and take off and, and he built a whole new kind of car, which is amazingly good. And, yeah. and. So and, tell me though, when you talk about computer innovation that you expect to happen or it, it may be already happening what are they are you what are you specifically talking about yeah so i'll give you a here's a funny example so i worked at apple and there was apple bought computers from amd and intel right and uh for example in the macbooks for a while yeah. And one, of, I won't say which one, but one of those companies came and said, we think computers will get 10% faster every year. 
And here's our roadmap for that. And the other computer said, we think that computers have hit the limit of performance per clock. And we are going to invest in um, accelerators outside of the computer, right? Okay. And then they both executed to their plans. And five years later, one of those companies' computers was twice as fast as the other one, yeah. right? And they were both just belief systems. And oddly, one of them believed in accelerators which later on turned out to be a really good idea because AI processing, when it started, was accelerator. Right. But they weren't actually investing in AI. They, they believed in accelerators, but they didn't have the killer application. Right. And then when AI first started to work on general purpose CPUs, people realized, oh, this computation is so regular, we can build accelerators for it. So move to GPUs. And then startups like mine said, hey, we can do a better job than a GPU because the computation actually has a whole bunch of behaviors that a different kind of computer will run that better, right? So then, so then innovation is kind of interesting because the innovation in the application is a, is a very particular set of ideas and quite a large number of researchers worked on it. Uh -huh. But Glenn Hinton was one of the famous ones. And then there was AlexNet that came out that kind of broke the internet and, right? But then once you have like an application that runs, it's stable. I'm a computer architect. I look at it and think, well, I understand how this data moves around, how the computation happens. We could build a better computer. Now, some of that is building a computer to need, which is a little different than inventing something. Ah. Uh... Right. Like if you want to build a big factory or a little house, it's not so much innovation that the factory is a big building and the house is a small building, right? The architect who's well skilled in building structures uses steel and concrete for big buildings and two by fours and bricks for small buildings. And, you know, so I'm a builder. Now, sometimes in the course of building something, you have problems like you want to do this and this and nobody's ever done that before. You have to figure it out. Um, so like in modern CPU design, we have so many transistors. It's possible to make something so complicated you can never verify it. I was talking with a friend of mine. She's a very good computer architect and she said, um, her number one problem is verification, right? Huh. And and I told her that's true unless you believe that when you start your design, which I do. I think it's a really hard problem, and then you partition your design into small verifiable pieces, so that the complexity is not some function of the total transistors. It's the complexity is a function of the depth of the quality of your interface definitions, right? So I, I put my energy a different place because of that. And, and then there's a belief, modern computers can only be so fast because of what's called unpredictable things. Like mm -hmm. which instruction to fetch next is unpredictable, which location of memory you get next is unpredictable. But it turns out, and AI kind of teaches us this, some things that people thought were unpredictable. Like, what's the next word in a sentence? That seems unpredictable, right? When you're thinking. Right. So human beings do a really funny thing. They simultaneously can say anything next, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you can pick any word you want. Yes. But you have no difficulty picking a word, right? Like, when you talk, you have no difficulty talking, do you? Right. And then sometimes when you're struggling to say something... You actually do something that's really interesting is you'll say something a little speculatively. And then as you figure out what you really want to say, want to say. you don't say, hey, I take that back. What you do is you say some more words to make the whole thing work, right? Exactly. And so it turns out we can build computers that, that do the same thing. So the, the problem of predicting what will happen when you have a lot of data and information, the more information and data you have, the better you can predict it. And then you can also 
make good enough predictions to make progress and then continue to make progress at, by correcting some of your not great predictions. And That's fascinating. Yeah. So yeah, it's her. Yeah. So this is one of the things that is like somewhat shocked people because philosophers and psychologists have sort of enjoyed the fact that thinking was impossible to understand. Right. And now the AI guys are saying it's it's not that hard. It's a lot of computation. Yeah. Like a million trillion operations to figure out a word. That's a lot. But and it's again, not exactly efficient. Yeah. Well, who efficient? What's efficient? You know, <laughs> your brain is it's only 20 watts. Like, this is amazing. Like, if people say, but Jim, you understand intelligence is really hard. And it's like, really? There's 8 billion people. They all have a brain. Get this. This is even funnier. Every cell in your brain can produce a whole brain. You have a brain factory inside each neuron. There's DNA. There's cell replication mechanisms. Like, and, and no, it gets even better. Your brain is made out of commonly available materials you could buy at the supermarket for about five to ten dollars a day. Oh my god! Like so, you know, it's carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, <laughs> hydrogen. You know, all right. There's yeah. a whole bunch of you know. There's some extra stuff, but but biology is mostly you know structure and information sequencing. Yeah. Yeah. And it turns out information sequencing is really cheap because if you have one thing that can replicate, now you have two, two goes to four, four goes to eight, you know. Right, right, right. Wow. Two to the one thousandths is a really big number, you know. Okay. Like, so the, to, to actually, you know, coming back to um, what would be the really basic components that allow you to make further innovation in computing, in your opinion? Yeah, the, the two trends we see now is, you know, how do we, you know, coordinate large amounts of computation and also, you know, the fundamentals of computing have always been computation, memory, and I.O., you know. So you do, you do operations, you store the results, and you move data around. Those are the three fundamentals, and they were figured out in the 30s. Like, so computational theory is amazing. You know, the, the fundamental rules of computation were figured out in the 30s and 40s um, before they had computers, and that hasn't changed at all. The quantity is, you know, gone from one operation a second to, you know, trillions of trillions of operations a second. So building the computers at reasonable power and then coordinating the operations is, is there's a lot of work to do. And then expressing the software computation has is, is been really interesting. And there's a, quite a large number of people working on that. And then, you know, the modern computer world, there's a very big dynamic because between, you know, there's users of technology and then there's companies writing software to support that and hardware companies building the hardware to run on it. And then the, the applications themselves turn up lots of interesting problems. And then the researchers are very distributed around whether they're doing fundamental research or they're making something faster or easier or simpler or understanding it. Um, the, you know, the limits for high-end AI more generally used are cost and power. Yeah. And, you know, and not, you know, that's one thing we're very focused on is how do we bring the cost down, you know, first 10 minutes and then a hundred, which we're going to do, by the way, it's, it's definitely going to happen. And then there's the programmability of it, which we're also working very hard on. You know, how do you express, like most AI programs are actually remarkably simple. Like an operating system has 100 million lines of code and a high-end AI model has a thousand. And that's because the, the operations are so big. Mm. So, so this is a, you know, it's a little bit of a mystery, but but even a thousand lines of code describes structures which are hard to coordinate. 
and like these you know these 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 operations are so large that when you deploy them across thousands of processors with all of them talking to each other and moving lots of data around you know it's, it turns out to be a fundamentally hard problem like nvidia has thousands of people working at nvidia and probably tens of thousands of people outside of nvidia writing code at wow. a low level wow. so it's I think it's the largest number of programmers per line of useful code ever ever done. <laughs> like this, a uh, it's sort of amazing. You think of a programmer should write so much code, but then, you know, if you look at, yeah, when a new model comes out, if it's really good, everybody will share it and copy it. Like it's, a, yeah, we're in a fundamental, yeah, we're in a very unusual era of computation. Most of the AI research is relatively open. Um, people can try lots of stuff, you know, Facebook release the llama language model with data, yep. weight programs, and everybody replicated it and tried it and play with it. Um, it's kind of amazing. Um, so, you know, in other words, that what's really changing, you know, this, bringing this much innovation, really the foundational ideas or foundational trends are that openness right i mean sharing that uh whatever the people learn in the ai world will be shared but at the same time something like risk five or something like chiplets all these things that are now being deemed you know the, the described as the fundamental elements of bringing new ideas to the computing how i mean how do you see that i mean how, how where do the we are we going in the right direction in your opinion yeah so like open source is really interesting because on the one hand linux is open for example like linux is the most sure. famous open source software right and there used to be 10 proprietary versions of the unix operating system which linux replaced right but when linux became open it didn't cause the value of operating system expertise and companies to go to zero it actually increased it Red Hat was was purchased for thirty billion dollars, and they made distributions of Linux. So, and there was no thirty billion dollar operating system before Red Hat. So, so it's almost like the open standards are like the physics of modern computation. Like when somebody discovers, you know, when Newton discovered physics, he didn't keep that proprietary. He published a paper, and then people would use his physics and calculus to go build a bridge that didn't fall down, the expertise. So RISC-V is a, a computer architecture standard that's published, right? Our company builds a RISC-V processor that's very fast, that's proprietary, right? So those are two different things. Right. So AI models are very interesting because you could have thought like PyTorch is the language you write it in and that's open, but the uh, Llama model could have been proprietary. But for complicated reasons, the Llama model is open and yet companies can use the Llama model to go build a valuable business and service because not everybody knows how to program in PyTorch and use a Llama model. And people often want the AI models to be produced for them because they're doing something else like banking or something. Oh, and, I see. Right. So, so the layers of technology are interesting. Like there are tens of thousands of paper published on transistor, you know, geometries and processes and characterization and quantum physics effects and stuff. But TSMC is the leader on building wafers. But TSMC purchases their key equipment from you know, ASML and applied materials, who are the experts on building high end lithography machines. Mm -hmm. But ASML buys equipment, you know, lenses and all kinds of equipment. They have like somewhere between 500, three and 500 suppliers. And some of the suppliers have suppliers. Right. So when somebody, you know, the, the, the stack of technology today is, very big and diverse and then there there are things that are open source like physics and math and linux right. and gcc and the llama model and the risk five architecture standard and then there are things that are proprietary and then there are things in the middle 
Yeah. And you tend to see more innovation where it's less proprietary, yeah. you know. And one of the things that ended the mainframe computer era, it was mostly owned by proprietary companies. And they stopped innovating because they had a captive customers and they didn't have to make a new product. Yeah. But yeah. The big car companies didn't have to make electric vehicles because that transition was very expensive. They didn't have to make them until Tesla showed that electric cars are just way better than gas cars. They're cleaner, they're more reliable, they have less parts, they're quieter, they're smoother, they last longer. You sure. Know, like electric cars are so much better than gas cars, it's not even funny. They're yeah. safer, you know, it just, they puts the weight at the bottom of the car, you know, you can redesign the front and back of the car for crash. Like, yeah. like the, the, the benefits turned out to be endless. Yeah. yeah. And, and now the other companies are struggling, some, you know, aggressively and some not so. They, um, they are. So, but, you know, just to wrap up, though, I mean, in your opinion, that you think that you're bringing Tenstorm based computing products, um, the whether it's a chip, or board or whatever, or chiplets or whatever. I mean, th that would fundamentally change the AI computing it is today. All right. So, so I'm running a company, right? Yeah. And then, you know, as a startup, you want to have some ideas you think are important and maybe better than other people. But also from a business point of view, um, and I think this is one place we're different, is we went and talked to a lot of people about what they want. Right. And and then, you know, like big, like like Microsoft and hyperscalers, they buy computers from NVIDIA. They like them. They would like them to be cheaper or, or something. Right. And so they say, how do you compete with NVIDIA? Well, OK, that's a business plan. That's a hard business plan because NVIDIA is a very good company. Jensen's a brilliant, you know, both technologist and business person. So um, but we have also talked to many customers who say, I want to build my own product. Like, mm. I want to own my technology. I'm interested in RISC V. I would like to license the AIP. I want to build my own product. I want a partner to go build that product. I want to see a demonstration of the software and AI hardware because it's very difficult and people have built AI hardware that didn't work or the software didn't work. So our business plan is, you know, we talked to lots of people. We've licensed our technology five times so far and delivered it. and. We have many more in the pipeline and we're working with them. And we have a couple of investors and customers who have very interesting plans for how to use RISC-V and AI in their products. And then as a business deal, there's a licensing, there's design, there's building chips and chiplets. Right. So, yep. so we found we found a lot of business opportunities. And yep. then for us, per, for me personally, what I know is if you have a good customer who's smart, yep. um, then they give you lots of really interesting feedback. And if they know what they want and they're pushing very hard, you know, then you get in this kind of positive feedback loop of we work hard to meet their needs. We also work hard to, to be something for them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we have many opportunities now. That may lead to multiple AI innovations that are bigger than Tense Torrent. That's right. But that's kind of so Steve Jobs said, this is a great quote. If all you want is money, you get what you deserve, which is nothing. Right. It's actually the same thing is true about innovation. Mm. If your only goal is innovation, it's not going to work out. Your goal in life has to be able to make a product that somebody wants that solves a real problem. Right. So, so there's people who innovate for the sake of innovation. I love those guys. They're researchers. But if you're building a company, you take an investment, hire employees, you need to be focused on building a great product. And, and then we found there's, we've talked to lots of people. Some people are, they want AI, but they don't want to build a great product. Well, I have some customers who want to build a great product and, you know, I can pick and choose a little bit because I want to put my energy with people who are also trying to do the best they possibly can. And 
And then what happens of, of that is then as you get into it, then this is the cool thing. Like you, you learn a lot, you get some ideas, you, you have some insight about, oh, wow, we could actually make this a lot better. And, and then I, that yeah. that's really important to me. That's what I like to do is build stuff that's hard because yeah. in the course of building that's hard, it's valuable. So that makes the business work. But when you build something that's hard, you also learn a bunch of things. But it's not research for the point of research. Like I'm not a right, 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 right. Like, but at the same time, I think you are at the very interesting point where a lot of people actually want to do certain things in their own way, and you're actually in enabling them. I mean, that's like the spread of the technology. Yeah. 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 Like when we built Opteron, it was like, how do we make a server that's 10 times cheaper? It turns out we did. And that was very successful. And that was really good. You know, we, we, and I worked on the iPhone stuff. It's like, how do we how do we bring all the performance of a MacBook? into a phone and then also the phone was really cool because people didn't care much about cameras and macbooks but they really love cameras and phones and you know there's some applications and also the screen was this is really cool the screen in a phone was small enough that you could put a way better quality screen in a phone per inch so the the phones got better screens before macbooks did because they were fundamentally smaller like now at some point people looked at the phone screen, it was so good. And they asked the question, well, why can't I have a better screen than a MacBook? Right. But so that, that happened, you know, Tesla was super fun because it was like, how do we make a 10 X safer car? Yeah. Like, yeah. like Elon takes that very seriously. We talk about it all the time. Like we want to make the car 10 X safer biggest cause of accidents is human beings. So how do we make the car fundamentally safer? And then how do we do autonomous driving? So people don't run into things when they fall asleep or don't pay attention or get surprised or or the roads are crazy, you know, like so, <laughs> so that so that had a real need. 10x safe right. car drove a whole bunch of technology. That's a great that's a great problem to solve. You know, so we were talking to customers that they want AI in their product, they want it to be cheaper, they want to own their own CPU and then be able to innovate on that. So that's that's really good for us. And it, we can... it is. And it's a it's really a different era. You know, it's not like uh, I want to build another PC. So I want your chip. You know, this is like you, you're talking about fundamentally different hardware, different application. Yeah. But they can. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and I've seen that like a whole bunch of people said, hey, you know, Intel builds these PCs. It's really good. I want to build a replacement part for the Intel PC. Well, they had already really optimized that a lot, right? So, so it was difficult to replace the Intel and a PC because Intel, they were great at, they were the best at building PCs, right? But low cost server, you know, AMD had a huge opportunity there. Like, like how do you build a better low cost server? Well, you, you had to focus on building fundamentally a better product first and then solve the problems to do that, so. Yeah, so AI is doing that. So there's there's places where, you know, like the big guys don't mind that AI is really expensive because nobody else can afford it. But there's there's so many companies that are like, how do we make this 100 times cheaper? In the middle, right? I mean, on yeah. one hand, there's uh, big guys, as you said, those uh, the, uh, the data center guys who own the data centers, they have a lot of money. But on the other hand, there's companies like Apple who can pay for building or designing their own chips and they can pay fortune to TSMC. There's like, there's a huge middle that has not been yeah. addressed. Then risk five, licensable IP, chiplets. These are a whole bunch of things that can bring the cost down for the people in the middle. So then they can go build their own products. So, All and right. that's what we're, that's what we do every day. Very good. On that note. Well, thank you very much for coming to this show and, uh, we just had uh, Jim Keller had this whole history of, you know, processors and uh, where we are today. Thank you so much for your time, Jim. All right. Great. Great talking to you. Okay. Bye. Right, bye.